to market new rock and roll, who was that white musician? Uh, well, actually, singer. He, he, he could strum a guitar. And kind of, you know, pretty basic. And he wasn't a songwriter. That was unusual. Usually, they had someone write songs for him. That'd be more a phenomenon the next second. So, we got the civil defense. And this whole idea that it could win a nuclear war. Oh, the, what was the uh, what was the super again? Yeah. That kind of represented the arms race. And we're going to jump right to no, we can't watch that. Europe. But the big thing was is that this idea of massive retaliation seemed to backfire because right here in the Formosa Strait, it looked like this is showing you that's the red. That's red China. But remember, if Red China does anything, according to the thinking at this time, who's really in charge? So, two tiny little islands right here called Quimoy and Matsu. Quimoy and Matsu. Little islands in the Formosa Strait. That's a strait between Taiwan and China. Two little islands. They're owned by the nationalist Chinese, Taiwan. Uninhabited islands, but the People's Republic, Red China. One of them. And two different times, the U.S. would actually send the entire Seventh Fleet and threaten nuclear war so Taiwan could keep these two little tiny islands. And I was thinking that if they take these islands, the domino effect will happen. More and more, they're called the domino theory by the mid-1950s. And think about it for a second. World War III, killing millions of people. Destroying civilization. So two uninhabited islands can't go to the People's Republic of China. That should give you the idea of the craziness of brinksmanship. The willingness to go to all-out war to look tough for domestic politics. The world is far too complex. And this gave a classic example. But what if there's a way to deal with this complex world where you can still act tough, but then do it in secret? And that is the meat of the 1950s foreign policy that affects us to this very day. If the world is too complex, let's use spies. The Eisenhower administration used the CIA for covert operations because the world was far too complex. So what we would incorporate, pigeons with cameras on their chest to spy on the enemy. That's from the... Uh, East German Stasi, their secret police museum in Berlin. It's a really cool museum. Well, we already mentioned Dulles once before. His brother, Alan, right here, he was the head of the CIA. The Dulles brothers would have such big impact on, the, on American foreign policy in the 50s, and the legacy goes on to the day. I mean, the Dulles brothers, acting in unison with other countries, using legal ties in some American and the U.S. government indirectly helped overthrow a democracy in Syria because they thought they might be communist. That will have no effect through today. Don't worry. No, they would not have put in a party called the Baptist Party. Did they really use it? Yeah. Yes. No, they tried. It didn't work very well. The Baptist Party is the party of the current dictator of Syria, Assad. Yeah. There's a lot of implications of what's coming on. And they thought the CIA could do it covertly. Here's the big thing. So the CIA is going to use spies. And the countries they go into and try to change governments, even overthrow governments, put governments into power, the people there know the U.S. is involved. The big thing is people in the U.S. had no idea what's going on. They had no idea that the CIA was doing any of this. What I'm telling you here, the next two big things, People in the United States do not know for sure until 1976. But it's going to have lasting impact to this day. So let's use covert operations to get what we want to avoid really using nuclear weapons and blowing up the world. But this is going to have huge problems down the road. So we uh, musical interlude. I'm for president, I'm for president, I'm for Go president, I'm for president, you like I, I like I, everybody likes I'm for president, yeah, I'm like I, I'm for president, we'll take I to Washington, we don't want John, or Harry, let's do that big job. 
Okay, so Iran. Don't you love that song? Oh, yes. it's growing. Wait till I give you get you the kitty for YouTube playlist. We gotta talk to, the, to all those uh, student council people who do this music during the break. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? I like I, that would be the greatest thing. Ever. Just on a loop. All right, so the first big area, and this one will be probably the best example of a CIA secret operation that will change everything. And the consequences directly affect us to this day. I mean, directly. What's gonna happen in Iran in 1953. So, Iran was a monarchy. In fact, they used to be called Persia. It was a big deal to call themselves Iran. That was a big name change. And the, people, the country of the Arabs. And they had a homegrown Democracy. They created it there, a parliamentary system, many different political parties. The leading party would they called it the Tula, and they had they had created this on their own. They kicked out the old authoritarian king called the Shah. So now it was a constitutional monarchy, but the power was in this democratically elected government, and it was very Iranian. So it looked kind of odd to people outside, but it was a democracy. And the premier and the leading politician in Iran, and one of the most famous people in the world in the early 1950s, Mohammed Mossadegh. I know it's a, it's a good, but it's deck. There he is on Time Magazine. He is going to become a hero for people fighting for freedom or independence from colonial rule all over the world. Mohammed Mossadegh. And the thing was, Iran was dirt poor, impoverished. And it's a multi-ethnic state. There's Kurds, there's Sunni Muslims, there's Shia Muslims, there's uh, um, Tajikistan, there's Pakistan. It, it's a very complex place. But they're dirt poor, and they shouldn't be, because what country signed a series of unequal treaties with them around 1900? to take all of their most valuable resource away, Britain. Britain signed all of these treaties. Do you remember the term economic imperialism we talked about in basic diplomacy? This is economic imperialism. All their oil. And back then, British petroleum was actually owned by the British government. And they got 98% of the profits from all the oil sales. And go, after World War II, Exporting oil became big business. European countries were trying to rebuild. There's very few oil sources in Europe, especially in Western Europe. Romania has some, a couple other places. That's it. Not only that, the United States is beginning. The United States oil companies are looking to the Middle East. Even though the U.S. at that time appeared like it had oil forever, the oil companies knew. They kept it secret for years. But they knew that by the 70s, easy to drill oil is going to run out. It's going to be much more difficult. And the U.S. is going to have to export more or import more oil. That's going to be big business. So U.S. oil companies are actually getting to Saudi Arabia as the British are in Iran. So with that going on, while this is going on, Mosaddegh took power, and what he wants to do is renegotiate a contract with the British. So not at least some of the oil remains in Iran. Some of the oil money. Money from selling. In fact, the biggest oil refinery in the world is a little island right there. British Petroleum built that. With Iranian labor. This is them money. Iranian labor building up the pipeline. Paid almost nothing, all the money went to Britain. They refused to deal with them. In fact, they call them Persia all the time. To mock their name to Iran. Just to humiliate. You know, we're not going to deal with Persia. You signed the con, or you signed a treaty. In fact, there was a joke in Britain. We stole that oil fair and square. So we want to keep it. Well, finally, 1952, the Iranian parliament voted with Mossadegh's support to nationalize the oil. Nationalize, what that means is literally the government took over the oil production away from British petroleum. Now, they had a lot of problems. The British made sure that only 
British citizens were the engineers, so they all left. And the British did a blockade. But Britain was furious. They were furious. They got that oil. They needed that money because they were broke after World War II. And now Iran took it. And who knows what this might lead to in other places, especially a place, uh, especially a country that was fighting for independence at that time called Egypt in the Suez Canal. So this has big implications for them. They went to the United States and asked them, help us get Paul McCartney back. <laughs> he is British. He is English. I mean, it all fits together. What happened? That's kind of weird, isn't it? You don't think so, huh? Pigeons. It's the pigeons. Pigeons. Yeah, that's actually at the museum, and the camera's this big, huge thing, and I'm trying to figure out how the pigeon could even get up in the air. How does the pigeon go back? Well, they pigeon go back to their coots. I guess it had to be on a timer. And the other funny thing was, uh, well, we used uh, bird guided. We tried to use bird guided bombs. Oh yeah. 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 And there was talk of attaching bombs on the dogs and I'm run under a tank. Yeah, we don't care how many people die, but not dogs. So Britain asked the United States. Britain tried to get the US to help them overthrow Mozadak and get the oil they have. But what happened was this. Hello. You have more full papers there. Must be the same thing. And what happened was this. Truman said no. <laughs> President Truman looked at, at this as a couple different things. First off, we want Iran and other countries in the Mideast as allies against the Soviet Union. We didn't do this, and there'll be resentment built up down the road. Even and, and also, your treaty is unfair. Renegotiate. Take 20%, 30%. Make a deal. Britain refused. But remember, this is 52. That's a presidential election. Truman's not going to be reelected. Who was elected president? Who? Ike. Also, a British government. You want to hear it again? Yes. In Parliament, the Labour Party was ousted. The conservatives came back into power, and a new old prime minister is back. Churchill. Churchill. Churchill's back. And so in December of 1952, President elect Eisenhower, who's already chosen the Dallas brothers, said they're going to take those positions, CIA and state. They met with Churchill. Ike and the Dallas brothers met with Churchill. And Churchill didn't come back and say, We want to steal our oil again. No, he said, Mosadek is in danger. Because Mosadek is really a communist. communist. He said he, he's a wolf in sheep's coal. He's a communist. And if and if Iran falls, Saudi Arabia, Italy, Spain, then of course, why not? All like a row of dominoes. So with that, they begin to scheme. And the brand new CIA would be used now in the 1953. Eisenhower has been inaugurated, and they began this operation using agents who had worked with they worked in the spy service in World War II, and then they're now part of the CIA. <coughs> and they operated what's called Operation Ajax, right out of the US Embassy. Iran forced the British out of their embassy because of what happened in 52. But Iran trusted the United States. They believed the United States would help fight and secure their democracy. They believed what the United States said the U.S. goals were. And they remembered that the United States itself once was a colony under British control. So they would be sympathetic. So the embassy was where they would run this operation. And so what they would do, actually, is led by a man by the name of Kermit, Washington, or Kermit Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt's son, Kermit. Kermit Washington was a basketball player. Why would I ever think of Kermit Washington right now? That's really weird. But anyways, their plan was they paid off the army and fundamentalist Shia 
clerics, which are mullahs, religious leaders, very fundamentalist, Shia Muslim, uh, Shia Islam is about 60 to 65 percent of the Iranian population are Shia Muslims. And what they said was, first off, they just bought the army off. There's money. They just bought some officers. And for the fundamentalist Shia Muslim, they said that most of that's going to bring in the godless commies and get rid of your religion. The U.S. would use fundamentalist Muslims in the Mideast for years to fight communism. This will have no bad effects down the road. None. Nothing to see here. Yeah, this will, there's a term for it. I'll get to it in a second. Hmm? Yeah, well, at least not. Well, with that, though, it failed. Most of them were out, were out, allied to Mosaddegh, but Mosaddegh refused to believe what was happening. He did not believe that they would actually overthrow him, and he was such a firm believer in the freedom of speech for a democracy to function that he never did even arrest the people who tried to overthrow the government, or at least try to silence them. Looking back, it is naive, it's, it's sad. And so, the CIA did not quit. Kermit Roosevelt and others went out and they formed a massive mob. They created a public uprising through a combination of a couple different things. Of course, the biggie is, this is a very impoverished country. How do you create a mob? It's impoverished. What do you do? The CIA. Here's money. Start chanting down with Mosaddegh. I don't know. More money. Yes, down with Mosaddegh. That doesn't really come up wrong, well, but <laughs> my guess is they actually said it Farsi. But then what do you do? You got to create a bigger mob. And so they hired a bunch of, and I swear I'm not making this up, circus performers. So like <laughs> jugglers and fire eaters and sword eaters. And they had these all come out in a couple of different city squares. So people came out to watch the circus performers. So now you've just created a mob. And now that you go through paying them, and then you start to chant down with Mosaddegh, and then they follow the jugglers to Mosaddegh's home. I'm not making that up. And that's how they created this popular uprising. And it happened so fast. This is the actual uprising. A few people were paid off, and they kind of got this mob mentality going. And then to protect Mosaddegh, the army arrested him and deposed the democracy like that. They brought back the son of the king that was deposed. In fact, Shah Rezi Pahlevi, there's the Shah. When I was a, when I was a kid growing up, Iran was an important country in the Cold War, and then a lot of things are going to happen there, and he was just the Shah, Shah of Iran. This is from Time Magazine from the 70s. I love that he's the emperor of oil. By the way, what happened to the oil? Well, first off, I should say this. I ate a poppy seed bagel. It's really tasty, but you know what I mean? Poppy seeds. But they created a very nasty authoritarian dictatorship under the Shah with a very active secret police that rounded up every leader of all opposition parties. And they would be known for horrific tortures and disappearances. And yes, they would be trained by the CIA. And they would send out, you know, talk about, they, they'd send out black cars to just round people up. And a couple of things are going to come out of this. First off, anybody want to guess what happened to the oil? I mentioned that once before. Well, it goes to the US. Not quite, not US. 40% went to US companies, a consortium of oil companies. 40% to British Petroleum. And then who got the remaining 20%? US. Yeah. Right. Him. It all went to the shop. So yes, he would build this incredibly huge army, and by the 1970s, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on American military equipment for the Iranian army. This was seen as a major bulwark against communism. Soon there'll be American military bases, including bases for spy planes called the U-2, which would be right here to illegally spy over the Soviet Union. This is a big deal coming up. And would create a very repressive state. Think about it, you arrest every uh, or every leader of normal opposition parties that want to bring back the democracy. Or I should have most of them just put under house arrest. That's a kind of surprising thing. Execute. 
But all the leaders of every opposition party was arrested. All the mainstream like opposition disappeared. And most people then, they look at that and think, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. The only people who actually kept the opposition going and so would be tortured and exiled were fundamentalists. We'll come back to blow back. Fundamentalist Shia, followers of fundamentalist Shia Islam. I forgot what Shia. Fundamentalists, the most radical. And this is going to be an example. I just got this out of order. A blowback. This will build up to what we call blowback today. It's a term that came out of the early 1970s, and it is the consequence of covert, unintended consequences of covert actions. Unattended consequences. I mean, the plan was to put in a compliant dictatorship in Iran. And what's going to come out of this will be earth changing, world changing, will affect everything. It's hard to find something that was bigger. Boy, for the first big major CIA operation, boy, they hit a home run. So think about it. the most radical. Shia Muslims by the 1970s, after years of oppression, they led a revolt. In fact, a lot of them thought they're bringing about the democracy. They carried pictures of Mossadegh. But this is going to lead to a revolution in 1978. And who is there? Who are the Iranian people going to blame for all their problems? Yes. Not just the Shah. They blame the Shah, but you can see it right here. The Shah is you is the U.S. puppet down with the Shah. Okay, they made this on in English for the Western press. Yeah, down with the U.S. Down with the U.S. puppet. Or Shaw's a U.S. puppet, down with the Shaw. And, and then Farsi underneath. And the point about this was, it's going to be led, though, by very radical, fundamentalist Shia Muslims. Who, yes, they might hate the communists, but they really blame the United States. So there's going to be American flags burned while they protest. The president, Jimmy Carter, his body, the burn or hang him or burn him in effigy. That kind of thing, you know, where they act like they're hanging him and burn them. You know, so that's President Carter. And most Americans had no idea why the Iranians were so mad. No idea. Which is really bad if you can't empathize with it. You don't have to <coughs> agree. At least nobody they're upset. This is huge. The Shah would be deposed and a fundamentalist Shia Muslim state would be created that still exists today. And very scared of the United States. Yeah. Is that an older picture? Did you take that? Oh. What? Yeah, that one. This one's from '78. Oh, okay. That's from like I think that's '74. That's when he just took power. And this is going to directly lead to a 444-day hostage crisis. The Shah got sick. He went to Egypt. Went to, went to Panama. Panama is an interesting place. Got pancreatic cancer. The U.S. led him. And the Iranians thought, oh, they're going to do just like 1953 again. It's 53 all over again. The cancer is just a lot, a cover. As it turned out, he did die of cancer. But Iranian students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and kept the, stealth, the skeleton staff there hostage for 444 days. That's, yeah. That's a year and a third, yeah. This would be during the election of 1980. And this uh, cemented the power of the fundamentalist Muslims and made them very, 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 very worried of American attack. Why do you think Iran pressed with a nuclear weapon? To deter the Americans. Yes. How many days did it 444. Yeah. So No, it just happened to be, they released them on... January 20th, 1981. Yeah. Um, what were the students involved? They were kind of radicalized by the fundamentalist Shia oh. uh, clerics. And that's not it. There was a real fear that this revolution might spread to other places, like Iraq or maybe the Soviet Union. All these areas of the Soviet Union here, they're Muslim. They're not independent. The, the stand, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, or maybe another stand called Afghanistan. 
They even took out their pro-Soviet government. The Soviets would invade Afghanistan directly because of this. Thus, Afghanistan. Afghanistan, Afghanistan has been at some kind of civil war since 1979, to this day. Yet most Afghanis have no idea why Americans would join the civil war in 2001. I have no idea why we're even there. Still don't really know. Just another invader. But I'm not kidding about that. Most of them didn't know about the September 11th attack. They didn't know. But back to this. The U.S. aided the people fighting the Afghans, especially fundamentalist Sunni Muslims. Heck, the U.S. even encouraged very radical fundamentalist Sunni Muslims from like other areas like Saudi Arabia to come fight the Soviets, including this guy named Osama bin Laden. And he would set up a base. They called it the base for recruits to come in. The term for the base is called al -Qaeda. It all comes from this. Yeah. So what do people say? The people fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. After the war ended, it devolved into continuous civil war. And including this, uh, okay, it couldn't go back. They, there are other attacks. They blame American policy for this. And we're not done. Iraq. Fearful of this, invaded Iran too in 1979, and for 10 years fought a brutal war. Um, yeah, because Iraq is actually 60, almost two thirds uh, Shia Muslim, but their their government at that time were Sunnis. There's a guy we helped put his party in the place, guy named Saddam Hussein. His name started rolling in. Why? Because of Iran. That would lead directly to after this war ended. Oh, they had to use chemical weapons. <laughs> They're all from mostly from the Middle East, but they would all go to Afghanistan and fight the Soviets, supported by the CIA. So all this over the Soviets. Well, all of it. Yeah, it's about the comp, but it all starts with Iran. Yeah. And so with that, I just told you how now the United Iraq because of. The disaster of that Iran Iraq war, they would actually use chemical weapons supplied by West Germany. Mustard gas, remember, remember mustard gas? The US would upset up that deal. And this is a long thing. They would be broke, they would have been Kuwait, we didn't the first Gulf War. The effects of that would be one of the justifications for a little group called Al Qaeda to start attacking the United States, including the September 11th attack. That would lead to the US invasion in 2003. Which would, like, out of that, would you would get ISIS that would spread into Syria. I mean, this, do you get my point here? This is a big deal. Yes. Yeah, Iraqis did. They started losing, so they used mustard gas. Isn't that a war criminal? Yeah, they actually went to the UN, the Security Council, but the US beat them. Because it wasn't a good guess. Yeah, we set it up. We set it up. And then later on, that would be an excuse to attack Iraq is they use chemical weapons. Even though we set it up. Most people didn't know that. This is a big, you get the point here? I can't begin to tell you. This is, I really went into detail for this one. But you can just see all this stuff stemming from this. And think about any other place that wants a democracy. Or they want to try to control their own resources. What's going to happen? At least that's what they thought. So we're going to encourage dictatorship. And so with that, we're not done. Flush from their success there, let's go to the other hemisphere, Guatemala. And don't forget what I told you about Iran. Americans did not know about it until 1976. <coughs> when they tried to say that the Americans did it, we said that was communist propaganda. And false. Fake. We said it wasn't true. Same thing's going to happen to Guatemala. They too have a homegrown democracy. And with that, yeah. Did you say if we didn't know it would be communist or we didn't know it? What we were told, if it, when, when people said that the US was involved, the US government said it was communist. 
And, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm sure the Shah was a dictator, but well, whatever. You know, most people didn't even know where it was. So, a democracy. They too had a homegrown democracy. Their leader, a former army colonel, Chicago. I always want to add an Italian accent to everything now. Chicago Arbenz. And there's our bands on the cover of Time. It's one of the time with the off camera case line, but so many things happened in this decade. He was a nationalist too, much like Mossadegh. And he had a problem. The crushing poverty in Guatemala was partially caused because the leading export of Guatemala, what's the leading export? Bananas. That's banana trees. Who had a banana today? Are you eating a banana right now? There we go. Oh, it is. It's dull. It's not Chiquita? No. Remember Chiquita? That's United Fruit. United Fruit. Remember them from Big Stick Diplomacy? They called them the octopus. They called Sandra Oil that too. They controlled 95% of the arable land in Guatemala. Either they directly owned it, or they had deals with big, wealthy landlords to get all the, the bananas. And their workers were in crushing poverty. So our Benz proposed, and the parliament agreed, land reform. I've mentioned this before a couple times, but Queen Lilulu Kalani did this in Hawaii. She tried to do it, and business, and the planners there, that's the whole, overthrew them. They're gonna, Force United Fruit to sell their land and then divvy it up to the peasants. So the peasants could get the land, they would form co ops to sell the bananas, and therefore the money would stay there and not go to the stockholders of United Fruit. By the way, the Dulles brothers were both stockholders of United Fruit, small world. And then with this, immediately once he announced this, I didn't even type it up. What did they announce? He was a communist. He's a communist. And the CIA flushed from their big victory in Iran. They set up a base, a secret base, so nobody knew about this base. In Honduras, a compliant dictator was there on the border of Guatemala, and they created an army of freedom fighters. That's their quote. They got soldiers from the old dictatorship of Guatemala. They got thugs and hooligans, actual pirates. Half of the army weren't even Guatemalans. But the stories that came out that the CIA planted, and they sent reporters down on these fake fact-finding missions, that these, this was homegrown revolutionaries against the communist tyrant, Arbenz. In fact, there's newsreel footage of this. And some of actually kind of funny. Then they found a leader. That's the funny part. They created an army, and then they created a leader. They found a disgruntled, Colonel in his Guatemalan army. He was mad that he was turned over for, for, for promotion. Carlos Armas. Now I'm going to skip a little bit. I, put, I should have put the pictures in a different order, but here's a picture of the, some of the soldiers, and they were a motley crew. And look at Armas. Look at the mustache. <laughs> I can't make that up. Yeah, that's just you. Got to be kidding. But the plan was to trigger this popular uprising and claim it was freedom fighters defeating the communist tyrant. In fact, Dulles would say that our, our mosque was the moral equivalent of George Washington. In reality, he was just kind of, well, this junior grade officer, they, they paid to go take over this army. Their plan was across the border. That's what turned out our bands was really popular. And the people resisted, and it was to say it's a failure is not strong enough. These freedom fighters, the army of freedom fighters, just ran away. They all just ran away. But the CIA is not going to quit. What do you do? You make it all up. Guatemala's a poor country. Bad roads, most people don't know what's going on outside of them. Radios are starting to spread out, but that's it. So what they did is they set up a really powerful radio station in Honduras. It jammed Guatemalan stations, and then on the radio reported false news. And the false news, 
Armas's armies win victory after victory after victory. And then, bottom all, that's not our force. So they got a few old planes with CIA pilots, but they claim they're our boss pilots. And they buzz Guatemala City, they drop some bombs, terrifying people. And then they actually put speakers on the roof of the United States Embassy in Guatemala City and broadcast battle sounds. You know, explosions and machine guns and stuff like that. It worked. The people panicked. Our bands realized the U.S. is going to kill me if I stay. And so he resigned. And this was reported in the United States as communism is defeated and freedom and democracy marches on. Thus I put on democracy. Did Armas create a democracy? He created a horrible military dictatorship that would last for the 1980s. And the thing is, nobody in the U.S. knew the truth. There were rumors and bits and pieces. They knew all over Latin America, who were still bitter about basic diplomacy. When Richard Nixon went to Caracas, Venezuela, as part of the uh, Goodwill Tour, you know, they said vice presidents on these little tours. His motorcade was attacked in Caracas, and people with rocks started beating on the window trying to overturn the limousine before they could get it out. And just fury, of course, we said it was communist guerrillas, but it was anger over operations like this. This is another funny one. So, this is our our boss being driven into Guatemala City. See the driver? That's a CIA agent. You put on the little floppy hat so you act like he was Guatemala. That's a pretty funny picture. Now, there are other operations from the Congo to Indonesia and elsewhere, but I gave you the two biggies as an example. And both are going to have blowback in different ways. And the thing is, as years go by, you can imagine what's going to happen. The United States will lose its credibility. People will lose faith in what the United States says, especially in the Mideast. So with that, the US was not done. We began to build military alliances all over the world. The three biggies, we already know about NATO, but we also created CETO and CENTO. Anybody know what CETO stands for? <laughs> You're right. It's, it's supposed to be here, even though France and Britain were in it. Southeast Asia. You know what's TO? Treaty. Yeah, treaty organization. And then originally it was the Baghdad Pact, and here are a bunch of generalists or uh, dictators from Central America or from Middle East. CENTO. And that was Central Asian Treaty Organization. I know that doesn't fit with NATO and CETO. I don't know why they did it this way, but it's Central Asian. CENTO. Now these alliances are gone now. But these would be this idea that they're going to surround the Soviet Union. So just, if you know CETO and CENTO, you're fine. CETO, Southeast, you know, that's... The big thing is other countries, um, maybe a country right there might be a member of CETO. That might be a justification for some little war down the road. Vietnam. Did, it, did I ruin it for you? Did I? Oh, and then the CENTO stands for what? Central Asia. I know. <laughs> yes, yeah. what's well, cent central? I know, I know. And this is a French map for about that time. The blue are allies of the U.S., the red are the commies. Yellow are not aligned. The other countries are still colonies. Yeah. Why is it so weird? Well, it's supposed to be focused, the center is here. They oriented her to the Mideast. But, and it's French. Sorry, French. Yeah. But, so the free world, that was called the first world. Here, the second world. And if you ever heard the term third world, it comes from the Cold War. That's the unaligned former colonies who are just starting to modernize. Third world comes from that. And so with that, one more time. I'm for president. I'm for president. I'm for president. I'm for president. You like? Right. Oh. <laughs> I was just gonna put a one. That's our kind of case. I think my computer doesn't like that. Should we get into one more little conflict in the middle here? No. 
All of these are going to have such long-term consequences down the road. From the arms race to Iran to the earthquake that's happening right now to French Indochina. Remember, French Indochina, when the Japanese took that in 41, that would lead to the U.S. embargo that directly led to Pearl Harbor. After World War II, the French tried to take their colonies back and immediately started a civil war. The Viet Minh were nationalists there who wanted independence. Everyone got that? They want independence. And there's all kinds of different groups. Most of them were Vietnamese, but they want independence. Those are pretty well armed Viet Minh in 1954. And in fact, they would control the countryside. And the thing about Southeast or French Indochina, we have a lot of different ethnic groups, but the Biggies, Cambodia, Laotians, and then the Vietnamese. And there are other groups in there too, but those are the dominant ones. And it's really mountainous, jungled. <laughs> and the thing about that was the French had built roads in colonial rule more than anything else to get the rubber out with the rubber plantations. But to move troops around when these Viet Minh would attack, it was ambush hell. You think about mountains and jungles, and that would be a real problem for the French. Real problem. The U.S. thought they figured out a way around that. But the leader of the Viet Minh was a man by the name of Ho Chi Minh. He was a former teacher. He was at Versailles back in 1919 to try to get independence for French Indochina. He was laughed out of there. And he did get some training and support from Moscow and other places. And even though China and, and Vietnamese hate each other for a thousand years, he got some support from them. But he was a socialist. If he's a socialist, that means he's a communist. And if he's a communist, that means who's in charge? All from Stalin. Exactly. And a big thing about this is China did a, and so this seemed to fit in with the domino theory. China fell, now French into China. Now, Mao Zedong didn't like the Viet Minh, but he liked the idea of them fighting for freedom. And he started helping Ho Chi Minh while the U.S. was helping the French. And remember, China and the United States were fighting in Korea. Enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. I should add that Vietnam and China really hate each other. And in 1979, they fought a horrible war. 50,000 people would die. In 1979, China would attack Vietnam. Amazing, that. a huge war, and I'm 99% sure none of you knew about that, right? Yeah. It's not. Not a bad thing, but it's you know that tells you how many wars there have been. Yeah. So who did China aid? The Vietnam. We aided the French, and we saw it as part of the Cold War. I should add this. I should add this. Roosevelt wanted French Indochina, as in all the other colonies owned by Britain, France, and the U.S. to be independent. He wanted that. He said colonization has got to end. But then he passed away. And Truman saw this as part of the Cold War. So ironically, the United States is going to aid a colonial power to keep their colony. By 1954, the U.S. is supplying two-thirds of the weapons and supplies for the French. They had over 500,000 troops then. And by 1954, it wasn't working. Here's a rice paddy, French soldiers, right outside of Hanoi, in American gear. And this guy hit the bottom. But by then, only a few areas like here and here, the cities the French controlled. By 54, they wanted out of this thing. In fact, they were looking for a way out, and the U.S. was pushing them to lose. Because now Eisenhower doesn't want to get blamed for losing Vietnam. So the French tried one more big operation. They're going to drop parachutists, and there they're dropping, into a place called Dien Bien Phu, or as LBJ would call it, Dien Bien Phu. And Dien Bien Phu would then cut off a Viet Minh supply line. And then it was just to try to win a victory because everybody knows, if they're really honest, it's going to go to some kind of peace agreement. France is going to pull out. But they picked a bad place. The parachutists went in, but how do you get parachutists out? Do they jump up to the plane? Yes. Helicopters were brand new. The French only had two of them. So you couldn't bring helicopters, pull them out. Helicopters were the reason why the United States thought they would win in South Vietnam. You have helicopters. You win. 
But they were quickly surrounded by the Viet Minh. Yep, come right here. And the Viet Minh would lay siege. They would surround it. Here are French paratroopers in the trenches. They tried to drop supplies to them, but the, French, the Viet Minh put anti-aircraft guns in these mountains. And the planes had to come in really fast to drop the parachuted supplies. Do you see what's happening in that picture? Who's getting the supplies? Vietnam. The Viet Minh. Half of men up in the Viet Minh. They begin to slowly but surely surround them. And do get this done. Eisenhower became so alarmed, he even considered using atomic weapons. They just lost them. To help the French save their colony. Think of the insanity of this. Fortunately, the U.S. would never get involved in something like this. No. Ah. See you tomorrow. Who said my name? I did. Oh, yeah. So yesterday I was like on this for a long time and there was a guy there from Vietnam. Oh really? Yeah, he talked to me after and he gave me like a piece of Vietnam after it. Really? How old was he? Um, he was really young, I would say like maybe his 30s. Oh really, okay. Yeah, um, it was like all about criminal, I don't know, criminal justice and criminal justice countries and I have people in America without um, issues of employment to them, so they had people in America without issues of employment to them. That's really cool. Yeah. Where are you from Vietnam, do you know? Um, I have this business card. <laughs> What? So I have this business card. Yeah, I'm just curious what city. Oh, Vietnamese. Bring it. I, I'll tell you later on, but it's really hard for you to speak. Yeah. Oh, it was hard to understand him a little bit because he had such like a thick accent. Yeah, you know. When you take a language, you have, the Vietnamese language is really complex. Yeah, right. I found a quarter. And you won the lottery. Yeah, but it has Harper's Ferry on it. I don't know why it's got a skanky quarter to Harper's Ferry. But you don't know? No. Well, I mean, I know it's Harper's Ferry. It's John Brown. It's a circle site. They did national circle sites. So they have all kinds of all that. So they have independent all They have all bunch of them. So you got the Harper's Ferry one. Yeah. Wow. So there's a circle. There's a Mount Rushmore one. They did national parks and national circles. There's a Gettysburg one. There's a Pittsburgh one. Yeah. So that's why Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry, if you go, it's still like it was in 1860. Uh, they try to make it just like that. See, it is a historical park. Yeah. Well, give me a chance to read it and get back. All right. Thank you. Do you like Ike? I like Ike. Yeah, I would argue everybody likes Ike. Well, you know, by back by popular demand. Yeah, Them, but then, or they didn't convict them, and then the guys came back and they made the commission. Yes! I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like I. I like I, everybody likes I, for president, I'm not the baddest, he's the gun, we'll make I do one, two, three, four, five, 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 four, five
Now is the time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. I can't. I can't let it go. Yes! You know, if you're going to do something, you don't go ahead. I for president. I for president. I for president. I for president. You like ice. I like ice. Everybody likes ice. I for president. What I say is, it seems to come. We'll make ice. You want to be done. We don't want God. 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 We don't Time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. Okay, so somebody skipped yesterday for a so-called knee for a doctor's visit. So I got to get that in there and get one more, and then add two more questions to your test. In fact, maybe the entire test will be about this. Please, that was easy. And before we get started. Yeah, there right, we go. Put your hand like this. Put your hand you like this. I'm too quick. Cannot box the box. All right, so Morgan's going to come up and talk a little bit about his presentation. We'll go from there. Hold on. You like I Oh, okay. Just put down what, what they are, who they were, and what their role was in the. Okay. So we got a little bit of the highway tears. Are we ready? You know, we need a song to play while he's coming up. Oh, yes. Yes. See, it's a marching song. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like I, I like I, everybody like I for president. Okay. All right. So, a little bit on, these are the highway tears, right? Oh, yeah. that's such a sad. What? What color is this? The Delaney? Yeah. 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 She's all over the world. All right, so let me get my notes out. All right, here we go, Morgan. So my paper is on the Highway of Tears, which is a Highway 16 from like Vancouver Islands all the way to about Prince George, British Columbia. It's about 720 kilometers long, and it actually stretches all throughout Canada, but the main part of the Highway of Tears is British Columbia. So... It's a lot, 18 people have gone missing along that road. Some murdered, some they haven't found at all. And they suspected that there might be even more than 18, but they've only really known 18 cases that are directly related with the Highway of Tears. And the first uh, missing person was in 1969. And I think the last one was in 2011. So it's gone for a good 40 years, and they don't really know what's gone, what's happening, but they put signs up along the highway saying, don't hitchhike, and they've made alternate routes because they don't want anyone else to go missing. And most of the victims, like half, more than half the victims are of uh, native, uh, first person descent, because that's what, that's what they're called in Canada, but they're not Americans. But most of them are 
for, uh, for, of first people descent. And do they have any idea who I mean, that's not? They're uh, a guy named like Jack Fowler, who's an American, like he murdered a bunch of, he's a serial killer. They found DNA on one or two of the victims, but that, and then he died in the 90s. So, and so, yeah, I don't, they don't really have any leads about it except for maybe him. Yeah, they're pretty terrifying, man. Hitchhiker, you know that. Because then we already had Gaskins as a hitchhiker killer, right? So, yeah. And uh, what are a couple of the stories you picked? Like of the, like yeah. of the, uh, I did one article on one of the victims, Delphina Nicole, who was 15 when she went missing in 1990. And she also, her cousin also went missing a year before her on the highway as well. So the family lost two people. From it, and then I talked about prevention by like putting up signs and putting up bus lines and alternate routes to keep people from hitchhiking. What about the other news stories from that era? Uh, twins winning the World Series, 1991, and then I did the Soviet Union collapsing, um, Hubble telescope, and the Gulf War started around that time too. <laughs> Hell of a world series. Yeah. All right. Good job. Yeah, I remember that. That was, that was a great series. Let's talk about that. Yeah. All right. So we got a few papers here. I'm going to pass them on one more time and take a look at. I'll get some hints of where they're going to be on the test. So go ahead and pass these around and look through them. I put Morgan's on there. I think there's a few more. And then we are going to. I had a. We had a change of plans. We are actually going to build Antietam Creek. There's Antietam Bridge right there. And we will refight the battle of Burnside Bridge. I don't know. I'd rather be on the About 200 Confederates kept them up. Should we talk more about that? All right, so here. Here they are. Go ahead and pass those around. Let me, there's a few more in here. I got them all mixed up here. Morgan's on top. Go ahead and take a look. A few things you can also jot down one, things from ones you missed. Does anybody else have their eight-man out worksheet? I just got Emma's and who else gave me? Oh, Joe, okay. And pass them around. Get to know each other. So I put through them. It... Wait, let me see at least. What's it at? Do you know what else I found? They gave these to Americans when they were occupying Germany right after World War II. A little book about how to treat Germans and keep faith with the American soldier who have died to eliminate German war makers. Do not fraternize. Don't talk to German women. I think I'm still recording that me saying that German women are evil.